Okay, this week we have business combinations. So um, the tutorial today, when we have that tonight at six o'clock, that's uh, lots of debits and credits with share issue and all that kind of stuff, shares and debentures. But today we start doing um, business combinations. So it's a whole new topic. Um, I put the study pack for you on Blackboard for the mid semester. So. The mid semester is not far away. It's week three now, it's week six, so it's only three weeks away. So um, it's all multiple choice, but there are calculations in those multiple choice. So the study pack's got the info sheet in it as well. Um, and it goes up to the material from next week. So even though next week is week four, and week five is a teaching free week, so we don't get to do the tutorial answers. Those tutorial answers are already up on Blackboard, or they will be in, in advance. But I am always fair, and I've made sure that the questions that you've got in the exam, you know, you don't have to prepare a whole balance sheet or a profit and loss or anything like that. It's all theory-based type questions, so there's 10 theory questions relating to that topic, all of which, so if you just read the material and you do, some of the practical, because the practical helps you understand the theory anyway. So if you just do read um, the material, it's not that hard. Right, so the mid-semester will be um, the following week, in week six. So it'll be Monday, so it'll be, it's April Fool's Day. <laughs> so in here, in the lecture. So make sure that uh, you're here early, So I'm not sure there's a class usually before us. And provided that they're running on time, we might get in here a few minutes early. So we'll just take the available time that we have. All right, so we'll have the class time. So there's 80 minutes allocated. Um, and that includes 10 minutes reading time. So it's at 70 minutes for the test plus 10 minutes reading. So 80 minutes in total. So we get 90 minutes here. So if we end up, you know, if you want to go, I don't really, I, we, technically we've got to be out of here five minutes before the end. So that's why I had to take 10 minutes off that just in case the lady before us was running a bit late. She's running a bit late, then we'll be running a bit late and that's the, your time that you'll get. If we get in, get early, get started, then, you know, I'm happy to give people an extra 10 minutes if they need it, I don't care. It doesn't, make, doesn't really make that much difference to the end result, but we can only have the time that we're allocated in the room. Okay, um, let's have a look at today's stuff with business combinations. So it's a nice, easy, breezy topic today. Hopefully it's logical. The technicalities around it, though, do actually get quite sophisticated and they are... Um, scrutinised quite heavily if a business combination happens out in the real world because companies um, engage in activities where they acquire com com companies for lots of different reasons. So the stock exchange needs to know what's going on and the reasoning behind that um, because it could be to hide debt. Um, it could be to... Um, maybe uh, you know with hostile takeovers and that as well but that's a whole different scenario but where companies um, are trying to hide debt or hide things and trying to manipulate their financial numbers the stock exchange always takes uh, close scrutiny of business combinations now in this unit we keep it simple we only look at 100 percent controlling interest so we don't look at a non-controlling interest, we only look at 100% where we're buying all the shares or all the assets and liabilities of the company um, and we'll do that when we do consolidation later. So today when we look at it, remember there's two sides to the equation when you're, when you're engaging in a business combination, you have the acquirer and the acquiree. The acquirer who is acquiring the assets and bringing those assets onto their books and the acquiree, the person who's selling them, 90% um, of the work today is on the acquirer. All right, so we'll keep it reasonably simple. So uh, there's quite a few different types of business combinations. Upon a business combination, so when two companies, so we'll, we usually just focus on two, it could involve multiple numbers of companies. 
but when a company takes over another company, they buy their assets and liabilities um, or a portion of their business and it's done at fair value. Right, so whatever the fair value of the assets and liabilities they're acquiring, we'll talk about that later. What, what it means is if the cash amount that you pay or the consideration transferred, whether that includes cash, shares, other, if that is greater than the fair value, you have goodwill. If it is less, you have a gain on bargain purchase. Now a gain on bargain purchase is very rare and unusual. If a business combination, if upon a business combination a gain on bargain purchase arises um, and you're a listed company, the Australian Securities Investment Commission will scrutinise it very, very heavily because it's very unusual. It may happen you know, if it's a fire sale or a company is going into liquidation or something like that. But if you are taking over a company and you're not paying what that company is worth, the Stock Exchange Security Investment Commission want to know about it because what it means is that the companies that were listed have been overvalued. It means that the information that they have is not transparent and the true value of that company's worth maybe is not reflected in the share price of that company, etc. So they want to know about it. So it is a rare event, but it does happen occasionally. Okay, so um, in the 80s, in the 1980s and that in the US, there were quite a lot of hostile, really hostile takeovers and things that, that went on in the financial markets in America. Um, it's very, um, well, America, you know, is quite capitalistic and the, that was an era in the 80s of um, lots of uh, activity where, and the governance systems at the time were not transparent, meaning that there was a lot of activities that could happen and people really didn't have a lot of control. So by such people, I mean shareholders and investors and other interested parties. So the laws have changed significantly all around the world, right, and particularly in the US. So the US, they have quite uh, strong governance laws. Uh, okay, so we're, we will look at our acquisition analysis in the books of the acquirer and account for that business combination in the record. So essentially, it's a lot of big words, but all it is essentially is what are you going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? Are you going to pay cash? Are you going to pay it up front? Or are you going to pay it later? Then you have to account for that differently. Are you going to pay shares? Are you going to transfer any assets? So how are you going to pay for it? Then what are you taking over? What assets and liabilities are you taking over? Is what you're paying more or less than what you're taking over giving you a goodwill or a gain on bargain purchase and then you just put it in your books? Well, accounting for it, it's, um, it's not that difficult. So when you have goodwill, that goodwill is capitalised and it appears under your intangible assets. Where you have a gain on bargain purchase, the accounting rules state that you must expense it. So it goes straight to the profit and loss. All right, so it's not really a lot. Okay, so we'll just go through some of the semantics with the rules. So with AASB3, that is your primary standard when you're accounting for a business combination. So within that one, that particular standard, that I'll left, there's a copy of that for you up on Blackboard. And if you go to the uh, accounting, Australian Accounting Standards Board, you can get copies of all the standards for free up there as well. But they refer to uh, AASB 10, which is looking at your consolidations quite a lot, and we'll look at that later on in the semester. Now, control exists. There's three criteria for control to exist. The uh, investor is exposed to or has rights to variable returns. Okay, so what that means is that the shareholder is entitled to dividends right, or some other form of variable return. They have the ability to affect those dividends. Right, the shareholders do influence decision making as to whether dividends do or don't get paid out. And they have um, the, the ability to affect those returns uh, through its power over the investee. All right, so control exists. So theoretically, if we are only looking at 100% ones, but if you've got 51% ownership, you have control. Right, if you have 51% ownership over the, the voting shares, Right, you have control. So when you have control, you must consolidate. Right. So the business combination, which we're looking at today, is the act of bringing the companies together. 
right? AASB 10, the consolidation, is how do we account for that when we bring them together? Right, so um, when we consolidate, if though, particularly if those companies continue on, because when you have a business combination, there are a number of things that happen. Sometimes the companies continue, sometimes they liquidate, sometimes they're just selling off part. Right, so we'll look at that. Okay, so um, these are the four general types of business combinations. So number one, A, limited, acquires all the assets and liabilities of B, but B continues as a company holding shares in A. All right, so it continues. Number two, A acquires all the assets and liabilities of B, but B liquidates, so it no longer exists. It doesn't exist, you don't have to consolidate, but when you have got uh, scenario one, the company is continuing, you must prepare consolidated reports. Number three, and a third company, C, is formed to acquire all the assets and liabilities of A and B, and they liquidate. Right, when that happens, when you have a business combination, um, we, a, a or B is actually the acquirer. C is not the acquirer. Just because it's a new company, right, when we are referring to the standard, we have to determine is A or B the acquirer. Right, so they become the acquirer and even then they, then they liquidate and they transfer over to company C. And that's a different process. Right. Number four, A acquires a group of net assets of B that constitute a business and B continues to operate. Right, that happens quite a lot, particularly when you're dealing with companies that might be in research and development or pharmaceuticals or um, software development type companies where they will create something, right? And that asset quite often is an intangible asset because it's been created, right? You don't really know what it's worth. You cannot record intangible assets in your books. So what companies do is they will create um, a, a patent and or a group of assets that are related to the research. They will sell it off to another company, which will most likely be a subsidiary of them, right? So that they can actually physically account for their new asset because you cannot have intangible assets unless they are purchased. Right, so you'll see it happen quite frequently, particularly with what I said with pharmaceuticals, things to do with research and development, software development, because how do you put a value on creativity and you know your ability to do that? So what you do is you put a number on it, you sell it, and someone is willing, who's willing to pay that amount of money for that asset, boom, it goes on the books. Right, and then they have to, they use that asset. So what you pay, what someone's willing to pay for it is obviously um, what uh, they think they're going to make, you know, be able to use it, be able to use it to make money. And there is definite value in pharmaceuticals, in software, software sales, you know, when there's markets out there. But they are technically intangible assets. Okay, so... Uh, like as I said before, if you create a new entity, you actually have to decide whether A or B is the acquirer. As part of the business combination process, in determining that who the acquirer is, uh, there are section B7 through to B18, I think it is, and AASB3, they, they actually highlight some of the criteria. And what it is, is the company which has the most influence. So who initiated the combination? Who is the biggest company? Um, which one of those companies un, uh, might have influence over the new company because they have maybe got three or four people on the board of directors? So it comes down to size and influence. All right, so that's, uh, that's how we identify who the acquirer is. Okay, so in, in terms of your um, acquisition method that we apply in accordance with AASB3, the first step is to A, identify who the E acquirer is. Step two, determine the acquisition date. Step three, recognise and measure the identifiable assets acquired and liabilities assumed and any non-controlling interest in the inquiry. We don't do that part, remember? So this unit, we are not looking at non-controlling interest. We are only looking at 
And step four is to recognise and measure any goodwill or gain on bargain purchase from the acquisition. Okay, so we don't need to, that's just a little note saying we're not doing non-controlling interest. But how you account for that, and that non-controlling interest is something I do in another unit I teach, which is accounting um, 5006, where we look at all those non-controlling interests and how you account for it in your books is different because you're looking at the fair value of the shares, things like that. So you have to recalcul recalculate all those values on acquisition date and what is the share of the non-controlling interest. Right, so where a business combination is concerned, it is viewed from the perspective of the acquirer. The acquirer is the entity that obtains control. They have control because they have power over the business and the assets and they can influence everything in that business. All right, this one example here, who was the acquirer? The acquirer, A or B, as I said before, under section, under section B13 through to 18 um, of ASB 3 there's a whole bunch of criteria in there. And as I said before, it's the size, who has the most influence, who's got power through people on the governing councils, things like that. So just out of interest, you might want to have a little look at that. So now the acquisition date is actually very important because that is the date that you calculate the fair value of your assets and liabilities and any shares that might be exchanged as well. So you must agree on that date. And you actually have 12 months to do all your calculations because to fair value something, it's not as easy as it sounds. Well, the fair value standard, WASB um, 13, which looks at accounting for fair value, there are three methodologies. And within those methodologies, there are three different levels of inputs as a hierarchy of where you get your data from. So some of that data is better than others. So if you're looking at market values, obviously if you have access to a market where you have got set observable prices and exchanges in a very active market, that is considered to be a level one input. And that is more reliable and it's more market-based. So level two inputs are similar to level one, but maybe they're extrapolated from it. So for example, you can easily look at data and, you know, market data and come up with good valuations. Now, level three inputs are basically contrived and they come from financial modelling. Well, it's not to say that level three inputs aren't satisfactory because they are, because the standard says you can use them. What that means is you might have to use, um, you know, methodologies which apply present values where you're looking at discounted future cash flows. And remember, any financial predictive model that you apply is only as good as the, the, uh, the different items that you put into that model. So if you don't put the right mod items in there, you know, it's like the stock exchange. Theoretically, the stock exchange wants, to ha wants companies to be as accountable and transparent as possible and divulge as much uh, info as possible so that the share price reflects what the market expects that price to be so that people can't technically make abnormal returns. Uh, so that's the whole point. The same applies with the fair value. Now, fair value accounting has been significantly criticised since the GFC in 2008 because it was the misuse of the standard that actually caused all the failure, right? Misuse in the sense that what banks were doing is uh, in the subprime mortgage market in the US. And so remember that the world is a very small place now. They are lending money from all over the world. So they're not get, so in America, for example, they were getting cheap finance from places like Greece and Spain and all these places. And this is why Greece and Spain are basically still um, got massive austerity measures and they've got lots of negative things going on with regards to their monies and, you know, banks not allowing people to get access to their money and all that kind of stuff. So Spain and Greece have been in a trouble. You know, it's 2019 now. That's right, it's 11 years post all the stuff that went on and they're still suffering significantly. So, and a number of South American uh, countries in that as well. 
So within that subprime mortgage market, they were getting this cheap finance, and what they were doing was loaning money to people that really couldn't afford to pay it back. Right? They overvalued properties as well, so they were technically using aspects of fair value and fair valuations and distorting their dis definition, description, estimation of what the market um, says that the, the properties are valued at. Now, what happens when people's properties are overvalued, they tend to go and borrow more money as well, <laughs> right? So they borrow more money to, or they, they consolidate loans, consolidate credit cards, all that kind of stuff. And obviously things um, turn, it caught up with them, right? Caught up with them because those people could no longer afford to pay. So you go through a couple of months where people can't pay, and we're not talking a small number of people, we're talking America. We are talking hundreds of thousands of people. Right, those hundreds of thousands of people accumulated and added up into billions of dollars, essentially, and that's why, and because the monies were loaned from all different places around the world, that's why everything just went, everything fell over. Now, Australia was protected because our money markets are not the same. We don't, our big banks don't borrow as much international money. They have rules and they have thresholds about where they get their money from and their cheap finance. And that's part of the reason why things are a little bit more expensive here is because they're not necessarily going overseas and getting all the, this cheap finance. All right, so that's... Um, but Australia was protected because of that. All right, so we, we actually came out of it pretty unscathed because, like in America, they bulldozed whole towns, basically because the smart people who got a little bit of legal advice that stayed in their homes and said, well, what are you going to do about it? You shouldn't have given me the loan in the first place. Some of those people, they were smart enough to actually be able to stay in their homes and have roofs over their heads, but um, the large majority of people um, had to, you know, got kicked out of their homes and moved out of their homes. And there were some areas, you know, like what it's like here. Let's look at Perth, for example. You know, you go up north you've got all these new housing developments up north and then you go down south a little bit um, past Coburn down there. There's all these new housing developments, right? So we're small fry here. You know, these developments have got, you know, maybe um, 100, 150. They've got lots of, you know, they're just in little small pockets. So you take that to America and you multiply it exponentially because remember we've only got just over two million people in the state. So America as a whole country has got plus 350 million people, right? So you go to some of these states and you know, they've got five, 10 times as many people and they've got their housing developments and new housing developments they had going. They just, they just, bulldozed, they just bulldozed whole towns because that was easier for them to do that. And, and by doing that as well, they created some new jobs because everyone was unemployed, but by bulldozing everything, um, it meant that, you know, well, we can start again. But it was actually uh, cheaper for them to get rid of it. Okay, moving on. So the acquisition date is important because as, like with share prices and with financing from banks, it changes from day to day. So it's quite important that you pick your date um, and that you're p both parties to the transaction, the acquirer and acquiree, agree on what that date is. And fair values is not something you can do in a week, right? It could take months. For example, I worked for a company and we had to um, review the valuation for land. And we had a number of people reviewing those land valuations and all three of them came back different. <laughs> they weren't even close. Um, so that process, and you like you realise, well, the market's obviously not clear, is it, when you're getting those professional valuations. So some assets where there is a clear market and you've got access to that market and you've got access, there are databases that you can um, get access to, but you have to pay right, to get access. So you can get um, you can get some good level one and level two inputs, but without that, you have to value your assets based on modelling. 
right? So, and it's part of that, it can take ages, but when a business combination, you get 12 months, that's it. Okay, and if you think about that, some accounting standards we have, have taken more than 10 years to get past. <laughs> so you can imagine if you've got parties in a transaction trying to work out values and uh, what they should and shouldn't pay and uh, what shareholders should get for the value of their shares and that it could take a while. Okay. So um, in terms of your fair value, your recognition, so you're in accordance with the framework definition, we need to recognise our identifiable assets and liabilities assumed, um, any contingent liabilities as well. So that's something which is different to um, your normal um, books. Normally, if you have a contingent liability, right, so a contingent liability is something which you think you might have to pay, but you may not have to. So let's say you have a lawsuit and that lawsuit, someone is suing you for a million dollars. So that court case could go on for a while and you don't necessarily know how much you're going to pay. That's a contingent liability. So you don't have a dollar figure to put in your accounts, but what you have to do as an accountant, if you're a listed company, you have to be transparent and you have to disclose it so it gets disclosed in a note right, in your financial accounts. However, upon a business combination, if you know that there is a contingent liability like a law case pending, right, that gets included with the valuation of the fair value of your net assets. Right, so remember your net assets is your assets minus your liabilities. Right. Um, so um, let's have a look. Sometimes with contingent liabilities, you need to use probability. So what is the probability that you're going to have to pay? Is it 10%, 20%, 30%? So you would get a professional judgment from a lawyer on that one, hopefully. I don't know about you, is this room just a bit warm? I don't know where the, where the, is that the? Oh, I was sitting here thinking, oh goodness, I'm going to faint in a minute. That's not a good look. I've already fallen over once. I heard a noise, I think it's going to come on. Okay, so uh, possible fair value of a contingent liability, you have to estimate your, your possible cash flows. Okay, intangible assets, like as I said before, upon a business combination, this is also something that you can do, you can actually recognise an intangible asset, a trademark, a patent of some description, um, you know, like in the movie industry and things, there's lots of different uh, intangible type assets that you can get access to as well. So, um, but you can only include it where it can be measured reliably. Okay. So you've got trademarks, customer lists as well, royalty agreements. So customer list is something in the 90s, for example, which was really big, where they um, businesses would they would create little businesses, get, get all these customer lists for things and then sell them off. Um, there's a lot of controversy at the moment now with some of the big companies selling off customer lists and um, you know, uh, because some of the bigger companies are uh, operating offshore, some of their um, call centres, so it won't be specific on who they are, but um, because some of the call centres are going offshore, they don't necessarily have to operate under the same rules and laws of the country, right? So even though they may have contractual agreements, being able to prosecute a subcontractor, someone you've subcontracted to do, do something and you've given them access to your systems, um, they're not necessarily going to, you're not necessarily be able, going to be able to prosecute them or prevent them from um, taking those customers and um, getting copies of who they are and then trying to use those customer lists for other things, you know, like trying to scam people 
um, or sell them products or whatever. So not all of them are scammers, but we do know that there are plenty out there. So, um, okay, so um, the fair value of an intangible asset, you would measure that the same way you would fair value a, a liability as well. If the expected benefit is $1,000 and there's a 90% chance that you're going to get it, then you value it at $900. So if you had a pharmaceutical product, for example, it's intangible, you don't know what it is, but you've packaged it up in a deal and you're selling it off to somebody else, they would want to see what your future cash flow potential would be for that selling that particular item. All right, or a copyright or a patent on a, um, a new product. All right, so you could um, value that at what you think you're going to be able to make from using it. Okay, so um, we know that fair value is an exit price. We've talked about the three techniques already and there is a three level hierarchy on how you do that. Okay, so a definition of fair value is the price that would be received to sell an asset or pay to transfer a liability in an orderly transaction between market participants at measurement date. So that's not something new, it's fairly logical. All right, so what willing buyers and sellers would realistically pay. So um, the three level hierarchy, so level one inputs are fully observable, like I said, and are unadjusted quoted prices in an active market. Um, and level two inputs are directly or indirectly observable. And level three are unobservable, meaning they are contrived using a model and using subjective numbers. All right. Having said that though, there are some, you know, that as accountants, what we do and what we should be able to do, if that's part of our job, being um, a valuer, then you should know how to reasonably value, you know, an item. So that's why you go out and you get a professional to value your land and buildings that for you, for example. But having said that, like I said, you get three people to value and you might get three different valuations and it happens all the time. Right, so what you have to do is try to, um, you know, do the measure which is the most reliable. Okay, so we have 12 months from acquisition date to determine those fair values. Um, and whatever that fa final value is, you'll either end up with goodwill or a gain on bargain purchase. But just to reiterate, gain on bargain purchase is rare in reality. We will look at it, obviously, in here and we'll account for it, right, but it just, doesn't, uh, it just doesn't happen very often. All right, your consideration transferred is the fair value um, at the date of acquisition. It's calculated as the sum of the assets transferred by the acquirer, the liabilities incurred, any equity instruments, so if you pay using shares as well. Um, the consideration, you can have cash up front or it could be deferred. All right, so when it's deferred, you'll need to calculate the present value of that payment. So when you calculate that present, present value, you will use your own um, standard borrowing rate that you apply. Um, the, it might include uh, other non-monetary assets. You could exchange land and buildings in there as well, any shares, any liabilities undertaken. Uh, if you issue shares, sometimes it can cost you money. That's not necessarily um, part of the um, full acquisition analysis, but it does come off share capital. Okay? Any contingent considerations and any other intangibles as well. All right, so we'll do a discounted one in a minute in the example. So you use your incremental borrowing rate. So whatever your standard incremental borrowing rate is. And remember that's different for everybody. So different companies have different levels of risk. So one company might get a loan from a bank and pay 5% and another company might be paying 12%. All right, so all these calculations are done in the context of the acquirer. <coughs> Right, so whatever their situation is, when the acquirer issues their shares as part of a consideration, they need to determine the fair value of those shares at the date of the exchange. Right, the other thing is when you are issuing 
shares, you have to be careful that you don't relinquish control because sometimes when you issue shares as a part of a business acquisition, it results in a reverse acquisition, right? Meaning the acquiree might hold the controlling interest, right? So, and you know, some companies might have reasons for doing that, all right? Business and the structural you know, arrangements that they put in place and they actually want it to happen, right? But if you don't want it to happen, you have to make sure that when you're issuing shares that if you want control that you make sure that you retain 51%. So we don't deal with that in this unit, all right? Because we remember we're looking at 100% acquisitions. Okay, um, so the quoted, we look at quoted market prices, okay. Costs of issuing debt and equity um, instruments such as transaction costs, stamp duties, etc., are um, considered to be in integral to the equity transaction. They need to be recognised directly into equity, so they actually come off your share capital, so we'll show you the journal entry with that later. So notice how we've got a debit to our share capital. Remember, share capital has a natural credit sign, right? It's normally credited to increase. So if we have share issued costs, we're going to debit share capital. It comes off that. Okay, sometimes there are contingent considerations as well. So for example, as part of the acquisition, you issue shares and you say that and they're currently worth $1.50, but remember, share prices go up and down. So you might have a contingent consideration that if the share price drops, that you will pay more money, all right? That you will increase um, the amount of cash that you pay. So we'll look at an example in a minute where we have a contingent scenario where we say, if the um, uh, price drops below $1.40, we'll pay X amount, all right? Or we will pay the difference, so the, the cost of that drop, all right? Which is 10 cents, 10 cents per share, we'll pay the cost of that drop. So we have to account for that as part of the acquisition. Okay, other acquisition related costs are expensed as incurred. Um, things like finders fees, legal accounting fees, other valuation professional type fees, general admin costs are expensed. Right, they're not included as part of the gain on bargain purchase. Now, so you've got that in front of you so that we can just pass through out of them, please. One of, and yeah, I really wanted that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> okay, you've got that example in front of you. Okay, so that's not big enough up there. Okay, so on the 1st of January 2016, A Limited acquired all the assets and liabilities of B. Details of the consideration are as follows. Do you want to go past her? Thanks, Rose. Okay, cash of 400,000. Half is to be paid on the 1st of January 2016 with the balance due on the 1st of January 2017. The incremental borrowing rate is 10%. So you're gonna pay 2,000 up front, 200,000 up front, 200,000 later. Because you're paying it one year later, you need to discount it back to present value using that 10%. So if you have a look at your PV table, I'll show you now. So if you go in one year, so N is one, all right, go over to the 10%, see how it's 0 0.90909, put a circle around that because that's the one we're going to use. That's the only thing, so I've given you a bit of hope about that, but that's the only one we're using. But keep that handy because we'll use present values with other rates and that and things for your homework and things like that. So that little PV table. So this is the present value of $1. Right, so it's a set amount in one year's time. When you're calculating the present value of an annuity, so you're paying 10,000, 10,000, 10,000 over a number of periods, and that's when you use the other table, all right, which is the present value of an annuity. 
right, so we're looking at the present value of $1 table. Okay, so we know that we're going to have to discount half of that back, that 200000 So, second item, item two, we've got 100,000 shares in A were issued. The share price was $1.50 per share. This price represented a six-month high. Cost of issuing the shares was $1,000. Due to doubts as to whether the share price would remain above the $1.50 level, A agreed to supply cash if uh, the value of the, of the shares went below $1.50. The guarantee was valid only for a period of three months, all right, post the acquisition. A believed that there was a 75% chance the share price would remain at or above $1.50, meaning that there was a 25% chance that it would um, fall below and they've got $1.40. All right, so that 10% variation, 25% chance, so that 25% we're going to account for as a, con a contingent consideration, include that as part of our acquisition. Right, the next one, um, supply of a patent to be limited. The fair value of the patent is estimated to be $60,000. So that patent, they would have to have validated that, all right, and worked out how much that was worth and what's gone into that calculation. You know, they have to, um, when they get audited, they, get, they have to validate it, all right. Um, as the patent was internally generated, it's not been currently recognised in A's books. All right. Legal fees and associated costs with the acquisition totaled um, $5,000. So we've got two lots of costs there. So back up to item two, there's a $1,000 share issue cost, so you might want to put a circle around that. That is definitely going to come off our share capital. The other costs we're going to expense to the P&L, the $5,000, that last item there. Okay, so let's go through the process. So, we have to work out our total cost of acquisition. So, you know from your handout and up here, our total cost of acquisition is going to be 594,318. How do we get there? We've got cash. There's two parts to our cash. There's cash up front of 200,000 and then 200,000 that we have to discount back using our present value table, which I already showed you. So, your 200,000 times by your 90.9091% to give you 181.818. We have got 100,000 shares at $1.50. We've got a guarantee, so there's 100,000 shares. There's a 10% variation and 25% of that, so there is $2,500 extra in our acquisition that we might have to pay in cash because we think there's going to be a 25% chance that it might drop. Okay, and our patent of 60000 the fair value. The, therefore, making that total acquisition cost there 594313 Right. So that's what we're going to pay. That's the consideration transferred. But what are we going to, um, what are we going to get for that? So what are our um, assets and liabilities? All right. So let's have a look. Oh, we'll get there in a minute. So you know what goodwill is. Goodwill is the extra, right, the extra. So if we pay cost of acquisition, 594000 If we pay, um, if the fair value of the assets that we acquire, when we go and look at the value of those assets, let's say they're 500000 that means 94000 is the goodwill. So what we're going to have a look at now in the next part is what the um, goodwill is. Okay, so you're given a list of assets and some liabilities. So the carrying amount, that's what the CA is, that's the carrying amount in the books of the acquiree. Right, they're irrelevant. What we need to look at is the fair value. So what is the fair value of those assets? So the plant and equipment, it's 367000 so its fair value was a little bit more. The land uh, has gone down a little bit compared to what's in the books of the acquiree. The inventory um, has gone up a little bit, which is unusual in the real world because mostly inventory goes down, depending on what that inventory is, right? what the industry is. Sometimes it goes up, but not very often. 
Uh, your accounts receivable, the fair value there is 16,000. Right, if you've got a carrying amount there of 18,000 and the fair value of 16, essentially what that means is you have doubtful debts of 2,000. All right, so you have to bring it into your books at the 18,000 but account for the doubtful debts because you're still going to be getting all of them and you still might get the 18,000. Right, but saying that the fair value was less is highlighting that $2,000 of the money that people owe you they may not pay. All right, you've got accounts payable there of 35 and you've got a bank overdraft there of 55. Right, there is also, B is also currently being sued by a previous customer. The expected damages is 50,000. The lawyers estimate that there is a 20% chance that um, they could lose the case. All right, so there is a contingent amount there of 20% of that 50,000. Right, so another 10,000. So to calculate the fair value of the identifiable net assets, so remember net assets is your assets minus your liabilities. So you've the fair value of your reported net assets we've calculated already at 580,000. Right? But there is a con potential contingent liability there. There's a 20% chance that we're going to have to pay some damages. Therefore we estimate that to be 10,000 that comes off. Therefore, the fair value of our identifiable net assets is 570,000. Right, our cost of acquisition is greater than that at 594. We are paying more. When we are paying more, there is goodwill, so we have goodwill of 24,318. Okay. So over the page, we do our journal entries. All right, so we're buying um, the business combination. We are going to receive all those assets and liabilities. All right, we're going to bring them into our books at the fair value. All right, so the fair value of the plant and equipment, 367, the land, 257, the inventory, 30, your accounts receivable. All right, we put it in there as a net amount of 16 but you could have put it in there, 18,000 accounts receivable, 2,000 doubtful debts. Right, but they would be on the other side, they're on the credit side. You've got your residual there of your goodwill, the 24,318. Your accounts payable at fair value of 35, your bank overdraft at 55, your provision for your damages, your contingent liability there of 10, your cash component of 200 that we're gonna pay, your deferred consideration payable. So that's basically in your books as an accounts payable because you're going to pay it later. It's currently in there at 181818, but remember you owe them 200. All right, so that difference, the 200 minus the 181818, that is treated as an interest expense when you pay it in one year's time. Your share capital of 150,000, those are the shares, all right, that you issued. The provision for your loss in the value of shares two and a half, and again on the sale of the patent of sixty thousand. Okay, so pop it all in those figures. So um, it's easy uh, to muck it up when you're rushing. All right, but it's not so hard. All right, there's a lot of logic to it. So we know that um, gain on bargain purchases don't happen very often. So what we'll do is we'll just change the scenario a little bit of this example and see what we do with a gain on bargain purchase. All right, gain on bargain purchase goes straight to the profit and loss. So over the page, let's have a look at our example two. All right, we've got a balance sheet with assets and liabilities there. So let's have a just a quick flick through. So we've got accounts receivable there of 20,000. We've got an allowance for doubtful debts of 2,000. Inventory of 20. Machines minus accumulated depreciation there of 30. We've got land at 40. So you've got total assets of 108. We've got liabilities. We've got accounts payable of 15. Debentures of 23. We've got some um, total liabilities there of 38 and net assets of 70. 
Our share capital is 30,000 ordinary shares, fully paid at 60,000. All right, so they are obviously $2 shares. We've got some other reserves and we've got retained earnings of 8,000 there, all right, giving us total equity of 70,000. So balance sheet, remember, net assets must balance to your equity. All right, some additional information on the 30th of September 2016, after a long negotiation, the directors um, decided to acquire all the assets and just the accounts payable. Okay, and the following information was avail available. The shareholders of PC received two fully paid shares and $3 cash for every three shares held in PC. The cash component was payable half at the uh, exchange date and half in one year's time, so we know that we're going to have to discount. Their borrowing rate this time is 12%, so if you have a look at your PV <coughs> table and you take one year's time at 12%, you've got 0.89286. All right, so that's what we will use for this one to calculate our present value. Um, the following liabilities were settled by PC with cash that they supplied as well. They uh, got to benches uh, that redeemed at a 5% premium. Liquidation expenses of 1,100. They also incurred uh, share issue costs of 300, other acquisition related costs of 2,000. Okay, so let's have a look. So our consideration transferred. So if we have a look, we have got 30,000 shares. So remember, we're going to pay, we're going to, for every three shares, we're going to, um, they're going to receive two fully paid shares in XY and $3 cash for every three years. So our shares to our shareholders, we've got 30,000 divided by three times two for the two shares at the dollar fifty, which is the current fair value, which is 30,000. Our cash to our shareholders payable now, right, we've got 10,000 times by three times by a half is 15,000 and then we're going to have to discount um, 10,000 times by 3 times by uh, the 0 0.8929 that we showed you before and here times by a half which is your present value of your 15,000 basically. All right, so that's 13,393. We're going to pay that in one year's time. Your debentures, so there are um, 23,000 in debentures. We're going to pay them at a 5% premium. Right, so if we take 23,000 times by 1.05, add on that 5% premium, we're going to pay 24,150. Our liquidation expenses are 1,100, giving us a consideration um, our cash component, sorry, there are 53.643 and our total consideration 83.643. Have I lost anyone? Everyone still with me? Yes? Right. Okay, over the page. Let's do our journal entries. Our net assets acquired. Prize in our share capital, our uh, cash component of 53,643. That's your acquisition of your net assets, 83,643. Right, our consideration um, payable, the amount of cash that we're going to pay now is actually the 53,643 minus the 13,393, because we're paying that in one year's time. Bank goes down 40,250 and our consideration payable comes down by 40,250. So we've still got that 13,393 in there, so it's not zero yet. It becomes zero next year when we pay the 13,393. Okay, we have other acquisition related expenses. Debit the expense, credit your bank. We have got share capital expenses, so our bank goes down and our share capital goes down. 
In one year's time, our consideration payable account comes down by the 13,393. We have got an interest component there of 1,607, and we're going to pay the remaining 15,000 cash. So let's have a, um, assuming the fair values of the identifiable net assets and liabilities acquired were 16,000, we've got inventory of 22, machines of 25, land of 30 and accounts payable of 15. Let's do an acquisition analysis and our journal entries. So we're assuming that our fair value, so what is the net fair value of the um, net assets acquired? So we just add them all up, add up your account, uh, assets minus out your liabilities. All right, so add up your assets to 93 minus out your liability of 15 gives you a net fair value of 78,000. So if you assume that we are gonna pay our consideration that we've calculated earlier, the 83,643, we end up with goodwill of 5,643. All right, doing our journal entries. You've got your journal entries there. We've got our um, accounts receivable in there at 20. Notice how we've got our allowance for doubtful debt. So I showed you the two ways. You could do it, put your accounts receivable in there as a net amount of 16 or separate it out like I have here. So one example, I've condensed it. This one, I've expanded it out. All right, both are acceptable. Um, it's usually better to show it separately if there's a possibility that you could get that money back or you could send it off to debt collectors, um, then you could potentially benefit from that. Put a pop in your inventory, your machines and your land, add in your goodwill of 5643, pop in your accounts um, payable, your share capital and your consideration, it all evens out. If we do the same and we're going to look at some slightly different figures to look at the gain on um, bargain purchase. Let's assume that our fair values of our assets are slightly different. We've got our accounts receivable is 17, inventory 23, machines 35, land 50, accounts payable 15. Let's do our acquisition analysis. Add up your assets, minus out your liabilities, gives you 110,000. All right, so we're on the last page of your handout there. On page six. All right, your consideration transferred that we calculated earlier of 83,643 gives us a gain on bargain purchase of 26,357. All right, how do we account for that in our journal? So we do our journal entry, we pop in our accounts receivable and our doubtful debts, inventory machines, land and accounts payable, your share capital of 30,000, your consideration payable, your present value of your cash component there, and your um, gain on um, bargain purchase goes straight to the profit and loss. All right, 26,357. All right, where if it was goodwill, your goodwill is an intangible asset which appears in your balance sheet. So it is capitalised. Now, once it is in your balance sheet and it's capitalised, we no longer amortise goodwill. What we do is we test it for impairment. Okay, so it gets reviewed and tested for impairment each year, as you do under the um, uh, accounting AASB 16, which is looking at your property, plant and equipment and that, where they test for impairment. And your other assets. Okay. Now, in the event that we, um, instead of um, buying all the assets and um, taking over the liabilities, quite often maybe we just buy shares. If we just buy shares in the company, <coughs> and then it's a debit to investment in company A, credit to cash. 
All right, so when you just buy shares, what that means is you are, the company is a shareholder and they get voting rights. When it's a business combination, when you are taking over that company, all right, it means that there is a business acquisition and you need to apply the business acquisition standard. Okay, the acquirer, um, shares in the acquiree. So at initial recognition, AASB9, which is your financial instruments, requires that the acquirer has to make an irrevocable choice. So regarding whether they record any subsequent movements in the profit and loss or other comprehensive income. Right, if your subsequent movements in the fair value are accounted for through the profit and loss, transaction costs are expensed. If subsequent movements in the fair value are accounted for in other comprehensive income, transaction costs are included in the measurement of the cost of the investment. Okay, so that's a quirk of AASB 9. You have to make a choice, and once you've made that choice, you can't change your mind. It's irrevocable. You must be consistent. Okay, so what that means is any movements in fair value either get expensed or they get accounted for as a part of the investment. Okay, in the event that the acquiree does not liquidate, so where the acquiree sells the business to the acquirer but it continues to operate as other businesses, any gain or losses, so this is in the books of the acquiree. So remember I said at the beginning, 90% of what we're doing today, because we're nearly finished, is all about the acquirer. Now in the books of the acquiree, Right, if they are selling off their assets, they have to take the value of those assets out of their books. All right, so their assets are going to have to be credited, their liabilities are going to have to be debited. They have to recognise the cash received, any shares received, investments in the company, etc. So you need to account for that. When the inquiry liquidates, we use a liquidation um, account and the shareholders' distribution account to affect the liquidation. So when you are liquidating, it becomes a whole new ball game then. There are new standards when a company is liquidating, right? And how that gets accounted for, how items get valued and how monies get distributed, who gets paid, etc. What order they get paid in, how much. All right, the, when the acquirer buys only shares in the acquiry, there's no books, there's nothing that's needed to be done because remember, buying and selling shares happens all the time. The only thing that changes is the list of the shareholders in the register of shareholders. Um, adjustments may be made uh, subsequent to acquisition in relation to goodwill, contingent liabilities and any con contingent consideration. Remember, goodwill can't be revalued. It is tested for impairment. Contingent liabilities need to be assessed as well for the likelihood of having to pay that. Any contingent considerations need to be adjusted. So if there are dates set, like we had in the example, there was three months that that contingency lasted. If that expires, then you need to account for that okay, and remove it out of your books. Let's have a quick look. So we have a, considerate, a contingent consideration. So at acquisition date, the contingent consideration is measured at fair value and classified as either equity or a liability. So if it, the contingency relates to equity items like shares, it should be under equity. If it's related to um, other items, um, not specifically relating to the movement of shares, it might be uh, recorded as a liability. All right, where it's classified as equity, no remeasurement is required. Subsequent settlement is accounted for within the equity. This means that the extra equity instruments issued are effectively issued for no consideration and there is no change to the share capital. When it's classified as a liability, it's accounted for under AASB 9, which is your financial instruments, and AASB 137, which is your contingent liabilities. Where the contingent consideration is a financial liability, AASB 9 requires all changes in fair value to be expensed through the p &L. Logical, isn't it? Okay. Disclosures. We're a business combination. We're not going to go into a huge amount. Just needless to say that where a business combination occurs, 
and it, there's lots of valuations and fair values and all that kind of stuff. Everything has to be disclosed, right, in an open and transparent way, uh, so that the shareholders know what's going on, what um, what company you're buying, what you're buying it for, what's the rationale behind it, how the valuations took place, because when you're changing that structure, particularly if you are issuing shares, depending on what price you're issuing those shares at as well, because if you're issuing them at a price below market value, that's not a good sign. If you're doing it above market value, that could be a good sign because it's an it's a indication to the market that you think the company is going to do well and continuing to do well, but when you issue at a discount, it doesn't look so good. You know, and the stock exchange wants to know why, why might you be doing that? So lots and lots of disclosures. So uh, they want to know everything. Okay, so it's quite a lot to take in there, but it's not so hard, is it? It's like I said, I can summarise it in just a couple of sentences. Number one, there's a the business combination arises when an acquirer is taking over uh, an acquiree's assets. You could end up with goodwill or a gain on bargain purchase, right? And then you just need to account for that in your books. So the acquirer, they have to work out what's the consideration, what components of cash are you going to pay? Are you paying it up front? Are you paying it later? We kept it simple. We just had an upfront payment and a one year payment one year later. In reality, you know that those payments could take numbers of years to happen. Right, so there is an example in the textbook where it shows you some of the disclosure that West Farmers made back in 2012, I think it was, when they were when they took over Coles. So you can have a look at what they did and what the considerations were. But I think it was like a $19 billion, I think, something like that, made up of a whole lot of different things. So, um, <clears throat> you know, it can get quite um, sophisticated and quite complicated. But for the purposes of our exercise, we'll just keep it, keep it simple. But even though we're keeping it simple, there are some little items in there that can that get a little bit um, complex. So you've got some homework now on Blackboard. I've actually, um, I think there's two questions I've put up. So I've put an extra one up for you um, to practice. So 3.4, I think was just your main homework one, but there's an extra one up there at 3.5. So we'll go through that one in the lecture and then you'll, I mean in the tutorial next week and we'll do a new one. All right, we'll do a new one. So in the workshop today, what's the time? So um, we are about 10 minutes early, but that's okay. You got <laughs> wait an hour anyway, so you got time for a coffee and that before we come into class. So today's workshop at six o'clock, we will look at our uh, share and debenture issues. So you've had your homework already, so if you haven't done it, you've got an hour and a half now to sit down with a coffee and have a go. You've got answers to three questions. Um, see if you can do them, if you don't have another class, that is. Um, and then when we go to class, I'll go through the ones that I haven't given you answers for, and we'll do a new one. Okay? So those of you that are coming to class, I will see you at 6 o'clock. Next week, we've got corporate disclosure. So it's all about ASB 101, so preparation of balance sheet, profit and loss, uh, statement of changes in equity. Okay, thanks for coming. I will see you in a couple of hours or an hour and a half or next week. <laughs>